I'm delighted to um, have the chance to speak to Dr. Georgina Ramsey, who's Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Delaware, and who has um, co-edited this special issue of Humanities on De-Exceptionalizing Displacement. So thank you very much, Georgina. Thank you for making the time to, um, uh, to be interviewed. Um, I really enjoyed your um, I really enjoyed your contribution to the um, to the special issue and I wanted to start off by asking you a big question which is what you understand by the uh, by displacement by this displacement that we're de-exceptionalizing us yeah so just uh, starting with a very easy simple to answer question <laughs> um, so I think it's really important to start with a caveat that uh, displacement means multiple things and that there's, I would argue there's no one definitive way to experience displacement. And I think that our special issue actually shows that really, really well. Um, but I think at the same time that there are ways of identifying forms of displacement across uh, like different, scales and also at personal levels so from global systems to to the personal and i would say that these are displacements that take the form of disjunctures so they're disjunctures that dislocate a person or a group of people from the systems and resources that are necessary to pursue a meaningful life and that obviously, you know, what it means to live a meaningful life is subjective. And that's what I mean by there's no definitive way to say this or that is, is displacement. So uh, whether these sorts of meaningful lives are related to acute sort of physical needs, whether it's about social validation and recognition, whether it's about existential being, um, or whether it's about a sense of future purpose. So there's all these different like layers of what it means to feel displaced. So when a person's existence is reduced or diminished into a sense of present survival, when a person can't reconcile their current life trajectory to the kind of future that they would aspire to, uh, when a person is alienated from the place they live because of changes that are going on there, uh, and when a person's sense of humanity is rejected by dehumanizing structures like exploitative labor regimes, uh, racisms, and like exclusionary housing markets, and fundamentally uh, conflict and war, which requires a level of dehumanization there, uh, all of these are processes that make people feel displaced. They're unable to reconcile their sense of who they are with the way that the world is structuring their experience. So in a nutshell, <laughs> displacement is at the like both really, really broad, but I would argue it's also very recognizable and distinct. Um, and just to kind of, as a side note, displacement is popularly sort of seen as attached to forced migration. And that's both in like scholarly accounts and also in like journalistic accounts as well. But it seems my issue for the past few years has been this focus on migration as displacement, which overlooks how I see migration as actually uh, a product of displacement, that the displacement happens before the migration, and that migration actually inversely can be seen as a solution to what it means to feel displaced. And I think when you actually talk to people who are trying to make those moves, they're, they're their movement is actually an attempt at resolution. But of course, those like violent border regimes that are in place to prevent that are then like reinforcing the displacement that was part of the problem to, to begin with. Um, and, you know, we've currently got at least 80 million people officially counted as displaced. And that's the actual term the UNHCR uses. And given that we're currently sort of living in this moment of intensified like political instability, economic inequality, and climate instability, right, that number isn't going to go away. So I think like looking at displacement as a, a force and a process and not as like this distinct problem of migration is is crucial for scholars in the future. Thanks, that's really a sort of helpful 
conceptual elucidation. And I suppose, uh, like a good anthropologist, you've actually um, been working very much with people's kind of daily experiences and embodiments of um, displacement. So I wondered if you could tell us a bit about the research on which your article is based. Right. So this paper particularly is based on fieldwork I conducted with people in Uganda um, who were designated as official what they're called convention refugees. So the UNA chair had said like these people are refugees. Uh, and that was back in 2013. So it was a while ago now. Uh, and then the other uh, sort of group that I work with in this paper is people who are homeless or uh, experiencing housing insecurity in the United States. So it's, it's a little disparate in terms of field sites, but the, the bigger picture is that it's, it's based on, I would consider like 10 years of uh, tracing displacement across different sites um, altogether. So there is a lot of field work like in different areas in between those two. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm just trying to think of uh, what other sorts of context uh, that you would need for that. And I think, so I work with Simon in this piece, and, and we might talk about him later, but I work with Simon in this piece, who is a veteran who has been uh, ho made homeless in the US. And then I work with these refugees in Uganda who've been pushed there by forces of conflict and war. And what was interesting and sort of like led me to think that I should put these two like experiences together, these two groups together, is that both groups of people are articulating like forces of state uh, dislocation as part of their, their experiences of displacement. So I know at the surface level, these field sites appear to be quite different, but they're all sort of tracing back towards like similar forces and processes. So that was my sort of thinking in terms of these these field sites and this field work. Yeah, I mean, um, I do think that your your paper opens with this really striking meme of this elderly weathered white man in military fatigues, and then the slogan "Like and share if you think our veterans must get benefits before refugees." I think that's really kind of yeah, that sort of sums up the. The kind of um, what's the word? Just just the, the the apparent disjuncture between these two groups. But um, I'm interested in kind of asking what what the grouping of people in this way does. So you know, so on the one hand, you're kind of critiquing. You know, you're, you're recognizing in the piece that actually, you know, homeless people or refugees people people are very, very broad groups that are partly kind of brought together actually through state policies. So what does the grouping of people as homeless or as veteran homeless or as refugees, what does that hide? And then conversely, what does thinking about displacement in relation to both of these groups help us to see? Yeah. Uh... I'm not gonna lie, it's it's a really tricky grouping to, to manage and especially to justify to external readers. And I, I understand that. <laughs> um, it reminds me, I, I wrote a, another paper um, with my old advisor where I was working with refugees and she was working with farmers in Australia and we were trying to like work with the two groups. So I'm getting used to this kind of like positioning and, and looking at, uh, people who wouldn't normally be put together in the same place. Um, and at least at a surface level, there isn't, it, it can be quite a problematic uh, grouping, I think, um, or to talk about these experiences in the same space. And what it really hides, I think, is the qualitative differences in experience that people within these groups have. Um, people who are, fleeing war and conflict are not having the same experiences as people who have been excluded from housing markets in the US for the most part. Um, there are still, even within those qualitative experiences, there are still aspects that are shared, interestingly. And I think that for me, uh, 
it's important to recognize the qualitative distinctions of experience there, but to recognize that any grouping, you know, is implying a level of homogeneity that may not exist. So anyone who's worked with refugees as a labeled group will understand that even within those groups, there's totally different levels of experience. Um, one of the biggest issues with going to a refugee camp in Africa, and I don't know any refugee camp that doesn't do this, is where they will put people from completely different backgrounds into the same space. And then everyone's a refugee. And it's like, it, it erases all of the ways that their backgrounds have actually structured why they came to be there. You know, you have refugees who are fleeing violence that was supposedly perpetrated by the same people that they're living next to in a refugee camp. So, you know, even when people say refugees, I'm like, well, <laughs> what does that mean? You know, there's, there's qualitative differences. So for me, the more useful way to uh, try to understand at a systems level, what's creating and producing these experiences is to recognize the qualitative differences, but also to collapse the categories to do that. And I'm really inspired actually by your work, uh, methodological denationalism to do that. Uh, I also think Catherine Besteman's work, uh, her more recent work is also really urging, particularly anthropologists who are really deep in this ethnographic specificity to maybe pull our analysis up a little bit <laughs> and consider like, what are some of the patterns and connections between the groups we work with and uh, others? So, you know, I'm, I'm not alone in, in doing this kind of work. I think there's others, including yourself, who are sort of like leading the way. So uh, when I started to do this and put people into like the same analytical frames, I began to see patterns in the forces that are creating displacement. Uh, and so like when I asked people who are homeless, like, why are you like, why did this happen? How did this happen to you? They would tell me it's because of state failure, actually. And I asked refugees from Congo, how did you become refugees? They'd say, you know, it's because of state failure. Uh, and then if I asked people why, people who are homeless, why they can't gain purchase over their life, why this is such a difficult situation to get out of, they would say things like labor market exploitation, not in those words, but, you know, similar sort of thing. They would say, uh, I'm being marginalized. Um, oftentimes people were struggling with PTSD and substance abuse issues, which are also huge in, uh, communities of refugees and also racism um, because a lot of the people who are homeless uh, that I work with are black as well so that's something that is kind of like obscured when we talk about homeless people you know it's like they must be their struggles must be because their their housing is insecure and it's like but why <laughs> so you know I think that that was a really important turning point but at the core what both groups were describing to me was that uh, they had been externalized from what they saw as the ordinary workings of their societies. So essentially they felt devalued, um, even though they were really trying to fit in with what the society around them was structured around, which in their cases was oftentimes labor markets, they still uh, were not able to achieve that. So, and this is a, a big side note, but uh, just to sort of bring in a third group um, beyond people who are homeless and, and refugees. So part of my tracing of displacement uh, took me to the DR Congo um, because most of the refugees I've worked with have been Congolese refugees. So I, I was really interested to understand what it was like in the Congolese context and why people were being pushed out. And they told me the same sort of story that they felt devalued. And a lot of it was because their lives simply didn't matter uh, under the pursuit of capital. Their villages were being kind of pushed out by foreign companies who were coming in to do mineral extraction. Uh, local conflicts were breaking out because of this and the government didn't do anything. So I was still getting the same kind of answers where they were like, well, you know, our, our lives don't have a way to fit in to these ordinary sort of uh, societies. So they, and they didn't really have an answer to how to deal with that. It was just this feeling of living your life, existing in the present, but without a way to um, 
sort of regain that recognition, that full humanity. So I'm not claiming that a refugee's experience is the same as someone who's like homeless, they're, they're qualitatively different, but there's still similar forces that are producing that displacement, at least from what I've observed. So I just wanna put that out there to the reader and you can sit with it, you know, you can disagree and that's fine, but uh, sit with the, the shared experiences there and, and think about what that opens up in terms of our analysis. Yeah, so to kind of um, dig down into those shared experiences, you give us two examples of displacement. You've mentioned Simon and there's also Julius. So what do you think those experiences tell us about the temporalities of displacement? Again, all these easy questions. <laughs> so uh, Julius and Simon. So Julius is a was a is a refugee um, who I worked with in Kampala, and Simon is um, a homeless man that I worked with in Philadelphia, and I worked with Simon later, um, like after Julius, and I I was really even when I was like meeting with Simon, I felt I felt the parallels. It was very effective in the field side. I was like, oh, these stories just remind me of my my friend, my interlocutor from you know, Uganda. Um, and what I didn't actually specify in the article is that both of these young men were uh, really trying to provide financial security for families. So Simon had a, um, a partner who was pregnant and uh, Julius had a, a family himself. So there were, there, there's a lot at stake for both of these people. It's, it's not just an individualized problem. And both of them were trying to enter into a way to create value, both economically and socially. They, they wanted to be validated. But for both of them, they were so marginalized from being able to do that, that their efforts led to injury, like physical and I would argue like social injury. Um, so, and this is where the qualitative differences come up actually is for Julius that looks like being like physically attacked uh, in one of the sites that he was working. He, he was an informal laborer um, who was perceived as taking work from others. And there was two incidences actually where he had been physically attacked um, to the point of like very, very serious beatings. And Simon uh, got an injury doing informal labor <laughs> for a friend. And because of the way that uh, work is so legalized in the US and because of the exclusion of people from healthcare here, um, he was unable to sort of manage that injury and, and he was living with it as a result. So both of them had been injured because of their exclusion um, despite the fact that both of them are really trying to find a way to regain that, that social value and that social recognition. So um, there was a lot sort of like complementing each other in, in those stories. Um, and what, you know, and given that both those stories are centered around informal labor, it would be a very easy sort of move to think, well, aren't you just talking about precarity then? Isn't this just precarity? And I, I love addressing this because it's something that uh, has come up a lot. And I think that what distinguishes this theory as displacement uh, rather than precarity is that in the sociological sense, like yes, Julius and Simon are embedded in situations of precarity. It's, it's labor markets that are based on informalization and casualization and like a lack of stability, right? And there's also the affective dimension. I mean, I love Anna Singh's definition of life without the promise of stability, right? So there's that temporal aspect of like not knowing what the future will bring that comes into precarity as well. But I've found, and perhaps this comes from the ethnographic richness of, of what I'm working with, is that there is more to their experiences than, than that. Um, in that their future instability comes from a vital, like lived embodied, this juncture. Uh, it's a lack of recognition. It's a peripheralization. It's a displacement that is actively in place to exclude them 
from being included in the types of systems that would enable them to address their precarity in the first place. So there are people whose lives have been disvalued and this hits at a different level to precarity. I mean, many of us can feel precarious, but like, do we, at what level does that become a sense of like, I am not able to address this. There's, there's no way of getting uh, myself included into these sorts of, these sorts of systems. Um, and so Julius sort of described that to me as feeling disrespected. He's like, well, there's no respect for refugees here. I, I remember asking him like, why didn't you call the police like an idiot? Uh, it's really good to reflect back on old field work mistakes. And, and he's like, why would I call the police? They're just gonna beat me anyway. And I was like, okay, fair. Um, <laughs> you know, the naivety is really important. Um, and uh, Simon told me that people like him were treated like he literally described it as trash. So that, that's, a, that's different to precarity, I think. Um, so in the article, I described this as being transformed into surplus value in this very complex, way that really needs to be read not spoken um and i'm bringing in some david graber like political value system stuff but ultimately in a temporal sense what it means to be displaced here is a feeling about being restrained into this grinding present and the existential frustrations of that uh you're suspended in a present time that never quite lets you invest into uh the future yeah, I mean, I, when I was reading your piece, I, I, I did keep thinking about, I did actually keep thinking about questions of honour and recognition and the fact that you can be honoured, but only in very, that, that actually the ways in which honour is granted and is attainable is that they're actually very limited and very very, and can be very difficult to achieve. And for some people, and anyway, I had to I have to restrain myself because I want to then talk about gender, but we're not going to do that. Yes. Oh um, yeah, another uh, gender group. and honor. But we'll 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 hold that for another day. Um, so I um, so because I, I I realized I started off by by I by talking about how your article started, but your article also finishes really well, I think. So nice. I'm just gonna read it, but I'm going to read it out for people that didn't have um, the chance to read the paper yet, because it's not out. Um, so you end by saying, and I'm quoting, the binary between refugees and homeless veterans is not an opposition as such, but a mirror reflecting shared anxieties. With displacement now a new norm of 21st century life, these stories of the displaced should, not be, ta should be taken not as exceptionalism, but as a warning. So basically, you're arguing throughout the piece that displacement is not exceptional, but is actually bound up with capitalism. So um, another easy question to end with, what are the elements of a political economy of displacement? So um, I am going to do it as brief a nutshell as I can, but it's also a deep dive. So just uh, come with me on this little journey. So in a nutshell, the political economy of displacement that I'm talking about in this article is a displacement that happens at the level of value systems. So what that means is that the displacement I'm describing is at once like particular to capitalism with its specificities of value that are produced through that. But it's important to recognize that that production of displacement can occur in other value systems as well. So it's not just, it is definitely bound up with capitalism and I will talk about that, but it also shows up in other, other contexts and other ways as well. And, you know, you briefly just mentioned gender and there's like, there's ways to also like do a displacement analysis in relation to gendered value systems and, and things like that as well. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and I think, in terms of like, as we're trying to grapple now a lot with the moment of political authoritarianism, recognizing that social value systems also produce displacement is really important because I've noticed recently this tendency to blame economic inequality on why people are feeling uh, 
you know, wanting to vote in authoritarian leaders. And I'm like, <laughs> you, you, not all poor people want to feel like want an authoritarian at the helm. So there's obviously something else going on. So that's a separate conversation too. Anyway, onto the political economy acts aspect. So there's nuances to capitalism everywhere. And I don't want to give the sense that it's like this totalizing system that affects everyone the same everywhere. At the same time, there are features of capitalism that uh, are defining, um, I would argue, and that uh, we can take these to be a dominant form of political economy. So uh, primarily what I mean by that is, uh, in a sense, we're defining our politics and political value systems around economies that at the very core put people uh that are, that are based around profits not people and i know that that's a very like hashtaggy you know profits over people people over profits but that fundamentally that is what is happening with the i and there's lots of capitalist logics as to why that works but i think we're living in a present that tells us that perhaps it does not right so uh yeah i think at its core that's something to recognize here and i know i'm simplifying it but simplifications can often reveal violences that when we get too much into the nuance, make it difficult to, to see. So the displacement I'm describing here is produced through this political economy, which consistently ignores the value of people while pursuing other forms of value. And this isn't an inadvertent side effect of capitalism, right? Displacement, I would argue, is built into the very foundations of capitalist enterprise. Um, and I'm arguing in a different piece that capitalism requires this displacement. So the earliest capitalist enterprises uh, were built on displacing people. So if you think about it in terms of cropping and extractive industries that were sort of being solidified in the, the 15th, you know, 1500s and 1600s, they literally required native people to be displaced from their land, right? That was a core aspect of it or uh, murdered, right? So it's, you know, Regardless, there's a logic of displacement there. And then, of course, in order to maximize the profit potential of these industries, they required a hierarchized labor force. And that meant removing people uh, into enslavement so that they could then also become part of that, that capitalist regime. So, you know, if you go back into the history of how these systems originated, they are grounded in displacement. So that's as true today as it was then. That has not changed, I would argue. And refugees who are the emblematic figures of contemporary displacement do not exist in a vacuum. They, they are made into refugees because of wars that are fundamentally fought over value systems, uh, specifically capitalist value systems in which we can look at the conflicts and wars that produce refugees as conflicts over land and resources that are endemic to the relentless pursuit of capitalism. So, you know, I work with Congolese refugees who uh, in the wars in the 1990s in Congo ended up with 5 million people dead, 5 million people. Like that's a incredibly violent war. And when I talk to people about why this happened, they say, you know, the, the foreign, <laughs> foreign intervention over like Eastern lands, which were rich in, in mineral resources that we're probably using right now in our computers was the core of that war. So, you know, to try and extract displacement from contemporary capitalism, it does not work. And the more we can look at the systems level analysis, it enables us to understand that and hopefully like pull that out more and maybe address it. So. Uh, my aim in looking at this political economy aspect of displacement is, you know, to challenge us to stop seeing categories, refugees or the homeless or whatever category we want to put around people as them being the problem that has to be solved. And instead to look at these enduring patterns of capitalism and displacement, which point us to the actual problem which in my eyes is that these value systems continue to fundamentally devalue human life. So that's the issue, not whether or not the categories work or you know how to reduce suffering within the categories. We'll always have the categories when we don't address that. 
Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Georgina. That's like uh, opening up whole new areas. Really, really fascinating. And I'm going to encourage everyone to um, read the paper. You get even more out of reading the paper than listening to the interview. So thanks ever such a lot. Oh, it's been great speaking with you, Bridget. I'm so excited for this project and the whole SI and it's, it's really wonderful. So 